Good evening. Hi, I'm Howard Gardner from the faculty here, and I want to welcome you to a celebration of a recently published book called Research in Mind, Brain, and Education. I'm speaking to you from Asquith Hall at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, but I've just learned we're being seen and screened all around the world. So wherever you are and whatever the time it is, we, we, we send you our greetings. I'm sort of interested in who's here, um, and I'm not going to ask you all to introduce yourself, but I'm interested how many people are current students in the Mind Brain Education program at Harvard? Okay, I would say that's 23% of the audience. How many of you are past students in Mind Brain and Education? That's 12% uh, of the audience. Uh, and the rest of you are just friends or cheerleaders or critics uh, and here to, here to enjoy the, the night's uh, uh, presentations. Um, because I've been on this faculty for a long time, I thought I would talk a little economics. We're at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, and because we're at Harvard, everybody thinks that we're very rich. But Harvard has for centuries had the rule every tub on its own bottom, and so the School of Education is what they call tuition driven. That is, every year, um, a large part of our budget comes from students' tuition. And I think all the students who are here know that, that you know, your, 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 your tuition is eagerly received. Um, there are other schools at Harvard which are very generously endowed, and so um, they're not as tuition driven. So the programs that we have here reflect the school's um, assessment of what there's a market for. This is a phrase that everybody in the 21st century will immediately understand. We are market driven. Twice in my experience as a faculty member here, um, colleagues of mine had come up with the ideas for a new program. In one case, the colleague was a woman named Jessica Davis, who had recently got her doctoral degree. And she thought that we should have, hi Kurt, hi Jane, and welcome. We've just had our guests of honor have just arrived, uh, Kurt Fisher and Jane Haltewanger. So welcome to you. Um, talking about um, the two times where uh, new programs were initiated. One was by Jessica Davis, and she said, there have been 41 theses about the arts at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, and we should have a program called Arts and Education. And the faculty, in its wisdom, ruminated for quite a while, and finally said, OK, we're going to have a program called AIE, called Arts and Education. Uh, the second time it happened was a few years later when my longtime colleague and friend, Kurt Fisher, said to me, why don't we have a program here which includes studies of the brain, of biology, and genetics? And neither of us were trained in that area. We were both developmental psychologists, and we were teaching cognitive development. But we were both interested for various reasons in biology, brain, and genetics. So again, as with AIE, we went to the faculty and we said, we'd like to have a program in mind, brain, and education. And the program wasn't too controversial until a faculty member raised her hand and said, I think it's fine to have a program in mind and education, but why do we have to mention the brain? Uh, and that caused a bit of a kerfuffle, but eventually we were allowed to um, have a program in MBE, and it exists and has thrived till today. In the beginning, um, Kurt and I taught alter alternate years, but then we began to teach together and lecture in one another's courses. And then a very happy event, David Rose, who is on our panel this evening, um, joined us, and then we would often be a troika, and we would teach one part of the course, and then we would um, interact with one another, and I think the combination of our three personalities and expertises um, was a, a highlight for the program. But happily, the program continues, even though the three of us have each gone our, our own ways. One thing that Kurt and I did, which really was ahead of our time, 
is that 20 years ago, when video existed, we said, let's put all of our lectures on video, and then we can have discussion. And believe it or not, we each put about a dozen lectures on video. And if anybody has an old style projector, they can still look at the video. I don't know <laughs> what you can do with it today. Um, and we changed much more into discussion, uh, more seminar-like, more symposium-like, and I thought that was very good. Um, we've had wonderful students over the years. Um, they almost all have some interest in research and some interest in practice. And quite a few have gone on to get doctoral degrees in one or another area of uh, scholarship. And almost all of them, again, um, bridge that brain biology uh, educational practice um, division. Also, and I'm sure that uh, the panel will talk more about this, um, when we began this program, as I say, almost a quarter century ago, there they were not programs like this anywhere else. Um, but now, there are programs in many countries, in many universities. There is a um, society, which several people on the panel have been involved in, the International Mind, Brain, and Education Society. There is a journal that's been in existence for over a decade. And again, panel has have been actively involved in that. And so um, uh, Kurt, with a little help from me, really started a movement. And even when people don't know about the mind, brain, and education program here, there's no place in the world where people who are informed don't realize that more and more we will be making use of various kinds of evidence from um, scanning and from genetics. So in that sense, it was very forward looking. So that's um, your economics lesson and your history lesson for the evening. And uh, I will tell you the plan for the rest of the evening. Um, shortly, the senior editor of the book will introduce the book and make some general remarks about how the book came to be and how it's special. Then uh, I will join the panel, um, and the panel will um, talk about some general issues having to do with the field and the book and today. Then I would say probably 30 to 40 minutes from now, we'll open up the um, floor to questions and comments from the audience. And I see two stationary mics. So you know, write down your question or write it in your neurons and trot over there and we'll, we'll take questions and comments. And it can be celebratory. This is a celebration with uh, Kurt and Jane and David and me here. Um, MBE past, you might say. Um, and uh, so comments are welcome as well. Then the panel will reconvene again. And of course, questions can be addressed to the panel. And we'll talk a bit about um, the, the day jobs of the panelists, if that hasn't come up already, and also about how they see the future of the, uh, the field um, evolving in the next uh, period. Um, if I have any closing remarks, I will make them. And I understand we're having a bit of a celebration afterwards. Is that right? Uh, Yes, it'll be a celebration, and we will celebrate whoever is watching this, uh, wherever you are. So um, in these days of, of uh, search engines, there's no point in having long introductions. Um, so I'm going to uh, give a three-sentence description of each of the panelists, and you'll learn more about them um, as the evening um, goes on. I'll introduce Mark last, because he's going to be the next person on the panel. But next to Mark is uh, Juliana Pare Blagoev, and she, I told her I wouldn't get her name right, but I tried. And Juliana was a student here and is now an assistant professor at Johns Hopkins. Um, her training, of course, was in developmental psychology and educational neuroscience. And she's doing work now which involves understanding and addressing the unique educational needs of pediatric survivors of childhood cancer. And Juliana is also associate editor of the journal Mind, Brain, and Education that I mentioned. Um, and uh, she's um, studied at various schools and before she came to Harvard. Next is David Rose, known to many of you. Uh, David Rose was both an undergraduate um, working with B.F. Skinner and a um, uh, doctoral... Forgive me. 
<laughs> and a doctoral, a doctoral student uh, um, working, among others, with Gene Shaw. And David tells me he's in his early stage of failing retirement, and <laughs> something which uh, you know, is the disease of, of people of our generation. For 35 years, he juggled two positions, a uh, beloved lecturer here at the Graduate School of Education, and the founder and executive director of CAST. Um, CAST, many of you will know, is an absolute pioneer in uh, um, the forms of learning that support every person and not people who happen to be born to be students. Um, and many people involved with MBE have been hired and worked at various capacities at CAST. And uh, this has also resulted in, in legislation to develop, to support the universal um, designs of learning. And uh, the, uh, um, my far left um, is Mike Connell, uh, who um, had the good or bad fortune to be one of my own students here, and a uh, wonderful uh, collaborator after, she, after he finished his studies here. Mike's a learning scientist with a background in cognitive science, computer science, artificial intelligence, AI, and education. He actually came to Harvard from having been a software design engineer at an obscure company in the, in the Northwest. What's it called, Mike? Microsoft. <laughs> Microsoft. <laughs> um, so he's going he's gonna to underwrite the, the programs going forward. Uh, he's also taught here at Harvard, at Dartmouth, and at the University of Texas. Um, uh, Mike co-founded and led an educational startup called Native Brain, and he's done consultancies in many for-profit and non-profit enterprises over the, over the years. And uh, the senior editor of the book is Mark Schwartz, um, who has also um, spent uh, good years with us here at Harvard. He's now a professor of education at University of Texas at Arlington, there, he created a Center for Mind, Brain, and Education from the Southwest, which includes a new master's program in MBE. Um, Mark is also a charter member of the International Mind, Brain, and Education Society, which many of you know as IMBES. Um, and he was vice president, and now he's a two-term president. So I'm happy to give the floor and the introduction of the book to Mark. You're going to move back to yeah. here. Well, thank you for coming. It's great to see you. I just, re I just thought for a second here, I have my entire dissertation committee here. <laughs> <laughs> so you can tell me how I did at the end. <laughs> but I, I was actually going to start with a different, uh, a different start. I was going to say that there would be no field without David and Howard and Kurt. I mean, there would be. Uh, nothing to talk about in terms of MBE. There, and there would also be like no book, actually, without uh, Irwin and uh, Phil and, and many of the others who were at the observatory who cared so deeply and passionately about the process of science. So I think that the combination of looking at the, a new field where new knowledge is something that is uh, a priority, but also taking great care in how that knowledge is produced and how it's used is also an equal responsibility. So I think those two, at least for me, I felt very lucky that I could marry both the, the ideas that came out of the Ed School, uh, championed at the Ed School through MBE, and the, the process of science championed uh, primarily at the, at the observatory. Uh, I'd say that what I tried to do in assembling all the authors is to, is to collect the kind of work that all of us are doing in different ways that represent MBE, but it's very hard to say that any one particular chapter does that. So you sort of have to look across the chapters to, to get a sense of you know, what it is that we're doing collectively. Uh, the field is still evolving, so I think uh, we're going to find that whatever we call MBE continues to change over time. But as uh, Howard said uh, somewhere along the line, we're just catching the, the pulse of MBE. So you know, today we put our uh, fingers on uh, uh, and check our pulse and see what, what exactly we, we're going to call MBE. For me, I, without even knowing it until I just thought about it uh, maybe an hour or two ago, uh, about 20 years ago, 
Neil Postman gave a talk here. And he asked a question relative to the internet and education. And the question that really captured my attention was, what is the problem in education for which the internet is the solution? Because at the time, the buzz really was, you know, we'll put everything online, uh, and that'll take care of educational needs. And of course, the, a lot of that we found over time uh, didn't address educational needs. But I like the way he framed the question. You know? you know, what is the problem for which I claim this is the solution? And I thought about the book in those terms. Now, what is the book the solution, uh, or what is the problem for which this book is a solution? And I, and I thought of there's, uh, there's really two problems the book tries to address. And, and one is this very tricky relationship called collaboration. Now, most of the time we do something that sounds like collaboration, but it really comes out as cooperation. Like I get what I want while you get what you want, and we're in the same room, and so we can come up with a negotiated outcome. Uh, but still, nobody gives up their position or their goals or their needs. And, uh, and educators understand deeply the difference between cooperation and collaboration. Now, collaboration, you've, you've got to give a little bit up in order to decide or, de or identify what is the goal that you can all collectively work towards. And MBE is tricky because you have cognitive scientists, neuroscientists, and educators all at the same table. They don't speak the same language, I mean, aside from English, but even then you, we could be using English, right, and still feel like I don't know what he just said or she just said. Um, we, have, we have different agendas, uh, we have different histories, uh, the traditions are different. I, mean, I can't imagine more differences coming to the table, and yet we assume that immediately we can, get, we can uh, just start working. Um, of course, I think that is an assumption that really needs to be tested, and that anybody out there who's thinking about work in MBE really needs to figure out what is it that you need to pay attention to in order to support collaboration. The, the other issue that I thought was missing um, was I didn't see often in science the, the more complex narrative that you see in the unfolding of science. I mean, usually when you read research or you read a textbook, you get a, you get a narrative that sounds like someone woke up some morning and said, oh, this is the research question that's really uh, of we're, we're studying, I'm gonna have the funding for that, I know what the, I know what the hypothesis is, and, and if you've been, and I'm sure most of you have been to middle school science, probably somewhere on the wall you'll see the scientific method starts with question, hypothesis, methods, and it ends with a conclusion. And it all looks like you know, uh, a script that's easy enough to follow. And then you wonder most of the time why you're, well, maybe not you, but at least maybe some of your classmates are struggling with that. So I, the, the second goal of the book or the uh, problem that I wanted to address was making sci portraying science more as it's lived instead of how it's portrayed in a, in a book or as in the way that it's described. Of course, we're, we're sort of trapped in this sort of linear way of, exp of talking, right? Even now, what I'm saying is linear. So uh, the book tries to break this up a little bit through all of our different stories that yes, we, we do have something to say in terms of the work we did, but how we got there is really a more complex story. And I, and I, I did want to bring that out. And so each of us tried to find places in, the, in our primary narrative, which is what do we have to contribute to the discussion on MBE? And the secondary narrative how did we get there, and which is much more dynamic. And I think that was an issue that I, I tried to play out in all the chapters or ask the authors to pay more attention to in all the chapters. How do we capture that, that, that richness uh, that describes, in, in maybe a more complex way, how we got to the conclusion like at the end of that line? Uh, if, now, Bruce Gregory is not here tonight, but he was, he was the source of numerous books all along in, in my career. And the one that I'd like to share with you, aside from the one that we're talking about tonight, is uh, one by H.E. Legrand. And it was called Drifting Continents and Shifting Theories. And, and I see Irwin shaking his head to that. It, it was a remarkable book, and I, and I think it still reads well. It, it really talks about the, the drama of trying to get a community of biologists and geologists and uh, physicists to come to an agreement on how did the continents get to where they are today. Now, 
I think we take for granted that you know, the, the problem was solved. But what was particularly powerful to me was that this problem was still alive while I was in high school. But yet, while I was in high school, we were still just solving problems, algorithms. And so the, this whole rich discussion was absent during a time when it was really quite turbulent. So I, I wanted to try to capture the idea that, uh, yeah, knowledge is not linear. It's not without debate. It's not without argument. And uh, what kind of data we decide that is uh, the data that we want to use or can use is, is really part of this rich, this rich discussion. So these are the two, uh, the two areas of the book that, or the two goals of the book that I really wanted to try to uh, bring out so that MBE could address uh, you know, a couple of things. One, that we have to move beyond the boundaries that define our disciplines or areas of study. Sometimes the word discipline may not be broad enough to capture cognitive science, neuroscience, and education. But there are boundaries there, and we have to figure out how to, how to work beyond that. Uh, much as the biologists and geologists tried to work beyond their own boundaries, their disciplinary boundaries, to come to an understanding. Uh, the work has to be collaborative. So that's a whole different skill set than most of us have. Again, the educators have the skill set, and that's something that I think that they can help in these, these conversations about how to move forward. And then, of course, my colleagues will be saying much more about that uh, through their own lived experiences. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, MBE, uh, brings people together with different histories, uh, different traditions, uh, methodologies, languages. So we have to cross all of that. Uh, so maybe the last thing to say about the book is that we thought for a long time, of, of what kind of book is this? And I thought about it as a companion book, um, something that you can refer to as a way of reminding us that the, the, the stories that we tell about what we've done always looks very different when you look backwards than as you're living through it. So we're, we're still trying to capture the here and now in something that is rather static, the book. So you have a sense of, of the journey. And so we'll use that metaphor a lot, the journey. Uh, and so each of us will have a chance to talk about these uh, two narratives and how we weave them together through the book. And so with that, uh, I think each of us will have a chance to talk a little bit about our chapters. And uh, I'll turn it back over to uh, Howard. Okay, thanks, Mark. Yeah, I think we all now want to hear something uh, um, about the specific issues you discussed in your chapters. And I think we'll start with Juliana and then go to Mike and then go to Mark and uh, give David the last word. Um, and I may butt in for clarification or mystification, uh, <laughs> whichever is needed, right? <laughs> The chapter that I wrote uh, with my colleague, Julie Booth, is titled, as you see here, Examples at the Boundaries. Um, and that term, boundary, uh, when we think about interdisciplinarity in the US, it often, especially around applied issues, it often draws on a medical model from a translational perspective, right, from uh, bench to bedside or something along those lines. That suggests a kind of linearity. And translation reflects an idea that an idea here simply needs translation, um, as opposed to further development, further change, further um, creation. And when I think about uh, what happens at a boundary, um, if you imagine crossing different boundaries, where you have um, an opportunity for communication, you also have an opportunity for change. And things look uh, maybe different from one side of the boundary to the other. And it becomes, in my mind, something very uh, dynamic and an adjustment across the people who are um, working across that boundary. So a boundary is not simply a demarcation of side A and side B, but a boundary is a place where change happens that allows for flow and communication that can be effective. The chapter deals with uh, the seven-year partnership between school districts, a research community, and a partnering organization. The rules um, of that partnership evolved dynamically, negotiated at these boundary, as, as we discovered our own boundaries, right? the boundaries of rules that the district had and cared about, the boundaries that, uh, within which the researchers had different rules that they cared about. 
and there was a third skill set, a skill set among those people who were agnostic about the particular problem that the district cared about, agnostic about the particular research questions that the researchers might want to bring, but responsible for clarifying the differences across those boundaries and the values that each held. So our job, we were successful only if the partnership survived. And for the participants um, who were driving the research questions in the problem areas, they would only stay in if their needs and curiosities were being met. In the chapter, we talk about the story of the algebra assignments that were created, and you see example, uh, these examples here, the title examples at the boundaries reflects that the materials that we created were called algebra by example, uh, because the, uh, the, the key for this particular partnership work was producing example-based um, math problems where there were worked out examples, you see them over here on one side, and then a problem to solve on the other, because there's an enormous amount um, of evidence from cognitive science that when you give kids about 50% of the problems that they have to look at to be worked out with these guiding probing questions that target problems that we know that kids in every classroom always have, right, quote unquote always, and quote unquote every kid. But by drawing, drawing their attention to these particular kinds of repetitive problems, uh, repetitive because they crop up in every classroom and every year, uh, teachers recognize, yep, I know my kids are gonna have those problems. Giving students about 50% of those kind, and then 50% that look like these normal ones that you just solve on their own, turns out to be a pretty good sweet spot for helping kids learn well, particularly those kids who come in with lower prior knowledge. Another important uh, piece is that it usually requires a mixture of both correct and incorrect examples. And let me tell you, when you tell a bunch of math teachers that we think it's a good idea to have their students learn from a mistake, there's a lot of bridling, there's a lot of bristling, and there's a lot of boundary level negotiation that has to come place because even when you show evidence that teaching kids through mistakes doesn't encourage the mistake, it encouraged thoughtful exploration and rejection of the path that led to the mistake. That was a conversation that we had over and over again with teachers as they collaborated with us to produce the materials and as, they collabor and as we introduced them uh, more widely. So the chapter tells the story about how those materials were developed, but also, um, as it says at the bottom, coming together as a beginning, keeping together as progress, and working together as success it takes a lot of effort to maintain that sort of partnership. I came into this work actually with a background and a history in uh, functional imaging. Um, so switching over to only uh, behavioral aspects of research was an adjustment uh, for my part. And I came away with a deeper appreciation, I think, for this kind of skill set about what it is, what is mind, brain, and education. Uh, and for me, it became the case that mind, brain, and education is people people who come together with a certain kind of set of skills, knowledge, and disposition, and that if you see yourself as somebody who is MBE, you tend to have a skill set like that where you are only satisfied when you are crossing boundaries. You're only satisfied when you're working with other people who are interested in crossing boundaries because you don't see content um, and disciplines where that supposedly cars nature at its joints, you don't see that that's the reality that you live, that there is a type of uh, recursiveness um, and iterative process that is baked into your dispositional stance around the research questions or the applied questions that you have. So I see it as people and as this process. It's a dyna very dynamic, it changes over time, right? When I came to graduate school here, there was no other option, more or less, um, and we didn't have a place to publish, and we didn't have a job prospect when we got out, because there weren't any uh, other places where we could teach, and we didn't have grants that we could apply for, and now we do, which is great. Uh, this process is highly interactive, and as Howard has written about in terms of education, education is a value-laden field. We don't teach kids what we teach them just because uh, everybody needs to know it. We teach them things because we have a value around them knowing those things. Similarly, MBE, with the negotiation across the boundaries, reflects that 
there are shared values collectively for people who are collaborating, but those shared values become things that are actively negotiated. They reflect different types of values related to educational practice and different types of values related to educational research. Bringing those together requires a very different kind of skill, knowledge, and dispositional base than is required to work within a single discipline. Thanks, Julianne. One question, you said you came with a background in functional imagery. Did that not come up in your work with the algebra and the teachers? Um, it did not. Um, um, I mean, so it, it was not a part of the research that we were doing. So if, if, for example, you were doing what you were doing, but you were also scanning the kids, mm -hmm. um, what would, uh, you know, how would that have complexified? Uh, well, at 700 bucks an hour per okay. scan, uh, there would have been that kind of complexity. But I will say that our early piece of, our early emphasis was only on cognition. And when we had some early findings uh, that could not be explained from the cognitive stance that we had taken, we brought in achievement motivation researchers and that the particular motivation constructs we were looking at have been explored using, using functional MR. Um, and that there is now, published in uh, the MBE journal, a study of looking at worked examples using imaging. And I'll say that the technique that you use to answer a question right, is driven by whether or not you can get money to do it, and whether or not you think that it's a valuable contribution. And again, from my perspective, um, it's a value-laden question. Do I think that it's a ripe time to use imaging methods for these sorts of issues or not? Uh, and I think where I landed at that time was that it was not, um, given the nature of our collaboration. One other question. Um, it wasn't, wasn't clear to me why the teachers, why the school system wanted to work with psychologists to make up uh, uh, problems and to direct what the students should be doing. Because I mean, there are lots of textbooks. So what was, what was their motivation? We didn't start uh, with the idea of creating a textbook. Um, so we start with a district problem. And the district's challenge was, actually, this was a set of districts, a subset of districts all participating under the Minority Student Achievement Network. And they had these were mo more heterogeneous. They realized that they were not serving all students effectively and banded together as districts. Initially, um, their goal within MSAN um, was to draw more effectively on existing research. And then they came to realize they needed to produce the research because there weren't answers there. So we started with, we want to work on achievement gap issues. Um, then we want to work on algebra-related achievement gap issues. Then we want to work on something that um, helps, that works with all students, and it can't require teacher professional development, um, and it can't require extra budget, and it can't be after school, and it can't be this, and it can't be that. And as we got to all those constraints, we realized, huh, assignments. That's a way in the back door that won't necessarily require professional development, et cetera, et cetera. One little last addendum. The um, Department of Education publishes uh, practice guides. In one of those practice guides, the recommend, one of the key recommendations for supporting kids in math was use worked examples. The cognitive science is there. So we reviewed the textbooks of all of our districts and none of them used worked examples. And we looked at a lot more things, and we looked at the research on worked examples, and we said, oh, actually, there's only two papers out there that are studying worked examples in classrooms. And of those two papers, they take a span of only a single class period. So there's not actually maybe the foundational research that would support using this in a widespread way. So we didn't start at textbooks. Lots of constraints pushed us in that direction. Well, very helpful. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks. for that context. Mike. Sure, great, thanks. The mic for Mike. <clears throat> yeah. So um, I started, my interest in learning started back in high school. And, and I kind of had this driving question about if we could reverse engineer learning, if we could really understand how learning worked psychologically and biologically, surely we could do better in education. You know, historically, a lot of educational practices came about through trial and error and people's intuitions about how their own learning works. So that was always kind of an interesting question to me. And then when I got to college, I studied 
computer science and cognitive science and, and AI, artificial intelligence, really trying to build, to develop the tools to do that work, to try and reverse engineer learning. And really I thought that this emerging paradigm of computation and, and understanding computational intelligence would be, would be a good tool set for doing that. Um, what was interesting was when I was studying it as an undergrad and then as a grad student at MIT in the computer science department, um, I was doing robotics. Uh, that's the kind of work I was doing and I, I kind of hit a dead end. It felt like this is really interesting work. We're doing phenomenal things in playing chess and you know, in medicine and, and things using artificial intelligence, but it's not giving us any insight into how people are smart. Like a chess playing computer can be you know, a grandmaster now, but it doesn't really give us any insight into what makes a human a great chess player or in fact how to make them better. So that was interesting. I mean, one thing that I already saw then, although I hadn't, um, I was studying it more from a kind of learning and cognitive standpoint, was that I saw that there were all these insights and all these models that were kind of piling up on the academic side in, in psychology and in neuroscience. And I, I realized that there wasn't that much that was moving across. It wasn't really having much of an impact on education. So this was puzzling to me. Um, so I also realized that I kind of tapped out in, my, in the doctor work I was doing, it, that, that it was kind of a cul-de-sac, it wasn't where I needed to be. So I took some time off and I kind of looked for avenues. How could, how could I find a place where people were doing this work of translation and bridging? And I, I looked at academia, I worked in industry and in, at, at tech companies, um, I partnered with people, I consulted, I tried to develop my own platform, and really just each one led to a kind of a different dead end. There were different factors that would block the work. Um, you know, Howard talked about the economics and being market driven, and I think that's a big, that's a good example, is that academics do a lot of really interesting work. They, they have insights about how people learn, and, and therefore, you know, we might use to teach better. But then when you pass it over the transom to the publishers, they have a whole different set of incentives, right? They're market driven. They, they, the kinds of constraints that Julie was just talk, Juliana was just talking about come into play and you can't necessarily do the work the way that you know it needs to be done. So, excuse me. So, I tried all these different avenues and um, couldn't really find a place where the kind of work was being done the way that I thought that it needed to be done. So I came to the ed school to study the education side of it more formally. And I remember I was in Howard's class actually in 1997 and it was, it was great. It was a survey class and we, we read papers like John Brewer wrote this paper called uh, Education in the Brain, A Bridge Too Far, in which he basically said what I'd already intuited. It, there, it's too big of a leap. All these people are talking about how brain science is gonna help education, but there are no examples of that. You wouldn't know it though from read, listening to the news, reading the newspaper um, or popular magazines, you would think that brain science was revolutionizing education, but it, if you actually looked at the evidence, it just wasn't the case. So, so that also got me further intrigued that, okay, people are actually talking about this gap because problems are you know, piling up on the education side and solutions are piling up on the, on the learning science side, but we're not, we're not doing the work to translate them. So, in Howard's class, I also saw a graph. 1997, one of, the, one of the paradigms that we were studying was this work that these people had done in early math education. Uh, Case, Griffin, and Siegler had taken decades of research on children's development of math understanding and um, an empirical work on how kids learn math, and they, they had hypothesized that, you know, kids coming into kindergarten, some of them just do well in the curriculum and some of them track down, they do poorly, and you know you were supposed to get everything you needed in kindergarten, so that was puzzling to them that something was missing in the kindergarten curriculum. And so they kind of traced it back and they used this research and they found something called the mental number line and they hypothesized, well maybe if we sort of develop this mental number line, maybe some kids get it at home, they play more card games, they play games with spinners and dice, and so they're getting more experience and they're developing the components of this mental number line. Maybe if we trained it kind of a little more directively for these kids who do poorly, who tended to be the kids from low socioeconomic homes, maybe we can close that gap a little bit. So they took a group of kids and they took the high, the kind of wealthier kids in one group, and then they separated out the kids uh, from the lower economic uh, environments, and they, they took the ones who had natural math aptitude and they made a second control group out of them, the kids with talent, and then they took the kids who were left, the ones who showed no particular aptitude for math and didn't have a lot of resources at home, and they made them the kind of intervention group. And all they did was pull them out three days a week for nine months for about 20 minutes a day. Um, and they gave them this intervention trying to develop the skills of the mental number line, things like, um, you know, understanding the correspondence between the number symbols and the numbers and understanding that when you move to the, you know, 
when you count up, when you add one, you kind of move to the right on a number line, and when you subtract one, you move left. So they were developing this very specific construct that the research had sort of identified. They found that not only did they reduce the gap, but they reversed the curve. These kids who had no particular math talent at the beginning and had no, didn't have resource-rich environment actually outpaced these other kids, which was stunning to me. I mean, I'm looking at this graph and it's like, that's it, right? I mean, we can actually take this kind of research and it overwhelms natural talent and it overwhelms resources in terms of its, its impact. So that actually set me on a course which, I mean, that's what the chapter is about, is a kind of the story from there of um, how, how do we take the research and then make it usable at scale in classrooms? And that turns out to be a really, really hard problem for reasons that are not necessarily obvious, right? People often think, well, we need to do more research and we need to solve more problems about how the brain works. That's not the case. We have tons of insights about that, tons of models, usable models. Um, so the problem really is kind of, and then another parallel track is just wrestling with the question of what's the proper relationship between education and these sciences. So on the right, we have kind of what I call the special sciences. You can see back there, Howard. You can see it back there. I can see better. <laughs> okay. um, on the right, we have what we call the special sciences, and it's you know neuroscience and cognitive psychology and so on, um, and that's people you know who do lab work and experiments and so on. It's academics, and on the left we have the classroom practice, and it's not a very it's not a very friendly picture, I realize, but. Um, you can kind of think of it as in the box on the left, a teacher, what is a teacher actually doing with kids? They see something, the child is you know, racing ahead or the child is struggling with something particular like vocabulary, but then they have mental models about what does that mean and what should I do about it? And then based on that data and then seeing, making the observations, they take some action. So they'll intervene, they'll adapt, you know, they'll try and help. Um, so that's really what the, that's what the teacher is doing in real time, and it's those explanatory models that are in their head that I saw as potentially the point of, the point of contact between um, the science and their practice. Because what science can offer, science doesn't offer educational solutions. Science offers explanatory models, and those things have to be, those things have to be built in, they have to be, uh, what do you want to say, they have to be embedded into a solution that'll work in a classroom. You can't just throw a brain model at a teacher and say, hey, you know, go improve your practice. But you see that all the time. That's kind of one of the models of how this work is supposed to happen and why it's not happening. Scientists come up with models and they write papers and then they give them to teachers and teachers are supposed to figure out how to make it work. That could be another 10 or 20 years of work um, on top of the basic research. On the other hand, sometimes publishers and other people have they have favored practices, things they like to do already, and they'll go to the literature and they'll pick little data, they'll cherry pick data to build a case that, hey, this is what we should have been doing all along. Look, all the evidence supports it. Neither one of those is a valid use of the science. So this picture represents kind of, and this is work that I did with Howard and another colleague named Zach Stein, um, just trying to figure out what is that proper relationship. And so the, the key idea here in terms of MBE is, you have your teachers who are doing their classroom practice and they have a lot of knowledge that's empirical um, as well as maybe some theoretical from training and so on. You have the sciences which are helping us to map you know, how reading happens in the brain and, and how math happens and so on. So there's a lot of models there. What's missing is that you need some way to get that into the, into the classroom in a usable manner and that's where I see MBE filling the gap. It's the two red arrows. Teachers have problems. Those are not research questions. Somebody has to translate real education problems into research questions that can be studied in the lab. I see that as an MBE function. Scientists then study those research questions and then they generate explanatory models for these different mechanisms. Somebody has to translate that into a solution that teachers can use in the classroom. And so again, I see those two points as, as the places where MBE really fills the gap is they straddle that line and they can, can do the translation piece. So my chapter is about, so the work that I did since then, I followed this work in 1997. I watched as these researchers built a prototype, showed that it had huge effects on kids, and then they handed it off to a publisher and it sort of disappeared, which was just heartbreaking because I actually watched this in real time. It's kind of like you with the plate tectonics thing. And uh, I, was, I was surprised, but I was also dismayed. So. Um, I decided, I, again, I tried working in academia in all these different venues trying to say, hey, there's this thing we should be bringing to light. I couldn't find a way to do it. So in 2011, I started a, not, a company, a, a startup with my colleague Jeff Durso, who'd done a bunch of startups, so that was helpful. And we decided to build 
a platform that would embody this, this theory, essentially, and put it in a form that teachers could use in the classroom. So that's a lot more than just having a model, right? It's got to be usable by kids. It's got to be engaging. It's got to be feasible for classroom use. It's got to fit into the, it's got a whole lot of constraints like Juliana was talking about. And so it's, it's, that's really the hard problem, is how do you cross all these boundaries from the research to the, to the development, to the teachers, and then, and then to the students, and then close the loop and figure out how you get data back so you can continuously improve. So a top left is kind of a snapshot of part of the curriculum. It's, there's an iPad app for kids, and it's for kids mainly four to seven, although a much wider range use it. Um, and it's, it's a mastery-based curriculum based on the research that I was talking about from 1997 and on. Um, and kids work through it, um, and they can unlock the next activity once they've demonstrated mastery of the previous one. On the right at the top is just a snapshot of one task in one activity. It's, it's to show you that it's kind of a constructive thing. It's, you know, the, the instruction would be something like build five or show me five animals or something, and they have to build it constructively. And it gives them feedback, and there's some scaffolding in there. But you know, four-year-olds use this. We've got th some three-year-olds on YouTube that are cranking through part of it on their own autonomously. Um, and then at the bottom left, there's a teacher loop. So there's a dashboard where all these data from all the kids in the class are fed to a dashboard for the teacher, and the teacher can just at a glance, even from across the room sometimes, see who's in trouble, who's struggling. They can also get the context on what do they need at that moment, what, what are they stuck on. Maybe there are three kids stuck on the same thing. You can pull them out in a small group, do some you know, hands-on activities, put them back. So it's designed to kind of work in a whole bunch of different scenarios in a, in a real classroom, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, small group, uh, individual support, and so on. And then at the bottom right, there's a you can click on any cell in there and it'll show you the, it's adaptive. So the curriculum uses the model, the cognitive model of how kids learn math, to, to give kids tasks that are at their just right level all the time so that um, you can see it kind of leveling up and leveling down as they, as they perform. And that's what learning is like. This is something that Kurt, um, Kurt's work really highlighted was learning isn't a linear, it's not a line, right? You don't just learn a little bit and move forward kind of incrementally. It scallops, it goes up and it goes down. You go home and you knew it and then you don't know it the next day and so on. And so that's what learning looks like and this thing adapts to keep it at their just right level. And so between that, where every kid kind of has this virtual assistant that's keeping them occupied at their just right level, and the teacher has the dashboard, now they can intervene and they can actually teach at a, kind of a higher level of skill where it's really needed. Um, so the chapter really though is about the story of how do you do this kind of work and why wasn't it working under the old publication model and that's really where the insights are is that it's not a lack of, it's not a lack of problems, it's not a lack of potential solutions or theory. The problems in making the translation really are sociological. It's we've organized the whole pipeline incorrectly and, and every transition and handoff between different stakeholders it's leaking until you end up with nothing at the end of the, at the pipeline. Uh, Mike, I'm sure other people would be interested as I am I. Who um, uses this um, device, this approach, and who doesn't? Uh, well, so we've got about 400,000 students around the world that are using it. And are they using them all in school or some of them at home? No, uh, we've seen it in libraries. We know they're using it in sort of like pre-K learning centers that aren't really schools. It's, it's designed for both home and school use, so there's different dashboards for teachers and parents. Um, it's being used in all kinds of scenarios. We've, I mean, it's in, on every continent except Antarctica. I don't think there are any kids there. Um, a lot of penguins. Yeah, so who's using it? And one of the remarkable things is we've used it in, so we were just, I guess, I don't know the name of the magazine, something like Dyslexia Today. We just found out that we were written up there and we were working at the Carroll School. Well, we did a pilot there. We, they were using it there and we were working with them a little bit. And one of the things the teacher said to me, we watched her, it was masterful. She had six kids and she had three on the iPads working at their own pace and she had three that she was working with manipulatives on a similar content. And then she'd switch them and they, she didn't really have to intervene with the kids on the iPad. And I said, wow, how'd you figure out how to kind of do that? And she said, it's never worked before because the kids do a few tasks and then they go back to a menu and they have to answer like, what do you want to do next? And so she said, this is the first time that it's actually kind of worked where I could do the teaching the way I want to do it. And the thing she said to me was, what's important for these kids is that they don't learn by magic. And what she meant was these are, these are kids with you know, learning disabilities and the curriculum is so poorly designed often that there's a huge gap and, the, and kids learn it not because the curriculum is well designed but because kids can get over, the, some kids can figure out how to get over that gap but 
kids with learning disabilities can't do that. And so it shows up, I think, the weaknesses in the curriculum more than in the kids. And so this was designed not for kids with special um, needs, but it was designed according to how people learn, how kids learn, and it worked across the whole range. So, uh, you know, I, I don't know that there's any kind of, uh, so I don't, that's an answer to your question, who's using it and who's not, is we found it works for a very wide range of kids. Good. Well, I'm sure David will have comments on this, but I'm gonna ask Mark to uh, be the next presenter. Oh, thank you. Thank, uh, thank you, Howard. I, I was just thinking about the number of times that uh, uh, it's not by accident, but uh, the number of times that uh, Mike used the word models. <laughs> and, and I have to say that uh, when I first started here, I, I hadn't really thought about models as anything different than theory or law, uh, even though I had a science background. And in a way, they all sort of resonated with each other. Uh, but what really stood out to me, uh, mostly working with Phil and Erwin and, uh, and Kurt, was how we take for granted the way that models shape the way we look at the world. I mean, they, they influence what we pay attention to, what we ignore, how we organize what we see into explanations, and then ultimately, if it's a great model, it'll allow us to predict what we haven't uh, seen yet or what we uh, would like to see if we change the context. That all sounds easy enough. I what was surprising to me was when you realize that you're using a model that you might not have uh, been conscious of. And I encountered a parable by David Wallace, I think that, compl that really captured the, the experience for me. And that, um, you, and you may know it, but it, uh, it begins with a couple of young fish who are uh, swimming together and, and talking about whatever young fish talk about. <laughs> and as they're swimming, they pass this sort of older fish, and, uh, and the older fish sort of looks at the two young fish and says, how's the water? Two younger fish keep swimming, and one looks at the other and says, what's water? The issue was, most of us don't know that when we're using a model that there's so much else that we may not be paying attention to. There's so much that we may not be accounting for, and we're just not aware of it. And I think it's very powerful in the beginning when you see that there's this organizing principle that you may be conscious of or not, and, and its limitations. And so my chapter, initially I was gonna write about something completely different, but I, I thought that the, it was so powerful, and in fact, it wasn't just me, it was, it was working with uh, the five years or six years that I was here working with Erwin and Phil. Uh, we, we had all these master students who were here to uh, earn a master's degree in science education. So they were working in the schools as well. And so, of course, they had the benefit of all these wonderful models of teaching and influenced by science. And, and I had this, uh, opportunity not only to work as a teaching fellow in their, in their courses, but I also followed the same students in the classroom so I could watch what, what, what they were doing in the classroom. And year after year and class after class and student after student, I saw the same thing. There was like this complete disconnect. It's like whatever it was that they were learning in uh, the classroom, and so I was there so I could verify, yes, these ideas were covered, these models were talked about. They were doing whatever it is that they thought was um, the way to approach teaching. So I, I often had an op opportunity to say, so I, I'm not quite sure I understand why you're, why you're ignoring all of these ideas that you're learning at the ed school. Why are you proceeding with, um, well, whatever is what they were trying to do. You know, m more, more discussion at the board or um, you know, things we might say, well, maybe that's too much talking. Like maybe I'm talking too much. You know, not that kind of self-reflection. Um, and they would always say, well, that, that, that what, they may, may or may not have used the word model, but they would just would have said, well, that, that's okay for, that's the ed school, that's what they do there. Um, yeah, but this is, this is the real world, and, uh, and this is how learning proceeds. And so I had to figure out, well, how do you see it? And of course, if you talk to people long enough, you begin to see how they organize the world. And many of them are so attached they don't even realize how attached they are to the way that they look at the world. 
I mean, they can acknowledge that there may be other ways of looking at it or thinking about the world, but it almost is like, oh yeah, right, that's, uh, that's nice, but um, sort of uh, not something that, that I'm gonna use to reorganize the way I, I look at the world. And so the chapter that I spent so the chapter I found out or <laughs> figured out that I was going to write as a process of talking about all the models that are available from the cognitive sciences and the neurosciences, all these models that help us make sense of how the brain works and how the, and how the mind proceeds or, or even how to work uh, outside of the student in a school or in a school system. All, all of these issues uh, came back to how do, you, how do you, the individual, how do you see the world and think about the world as a um, functioning? Especially educational models. And then what counts as a model and what doesn't count as a model? I mean, there were, uh, I think there's this very useful way of thinking about uh, tools that we use that make some problems easier to solve. And we call those heuristics. So in a pinch, you have to make a decision. Uh, I was trying to think of a quick heuristic, but the one that came to mind, I don't know if that's useful. A stitch in time saves nine, but uh, maybe that's to keep, uh, maybe there's some better heuristics. Um, more is better. I don't know if that actually turns out to be a bit. But these are very simple, simple ways of organizing our lives, but in the, in the end, they don't really hold up to perhaps lots of different contexts and scrutiny. And in education, there are lots of heuristics. They're different than models, the kinds that you can test. And I think part of the object of the book and the chapter is to call attention to the fact that we can organize the way we think about our lives in terms of what am I paying attention to? What am I ignoring? What, am I, what are my assumptions? And if I test these in a rigorous way, then what would I find out? And I found that I was just as much a victim of my own ideas, falling in love with my own ideas. And I think it was either Irwin or Bruce or maybe Phil who would say, don't fall in love with your ideas. Your ideas are not your friends, so don't defend them as though they were. And that kind of frees you up in order to think about, okay, well then how do I think about the world? And, uh, and how do I challenge it in a way that it's not personal, but may or may not hold up as we, uh, as we test it. And that for me was a slow process. And I think for some of us, uh, most of it has to come from recognizing that I can stand back or I want to stand back from the way that I, I look at the world. And uh, I, th I invited all of the authors to, to think about their models in a very explicit way and talk about them in very explicit way so that you could see that here is the way each of the authors were organizing their, their world. Well, organizing the way they looked at the world. What do I pay attention to? What do I ignore consciously, maybe even unconsciously? So would it be fair to say that the book is kind of a meta book that, I, uh, that typically people just sort of say, this is what I did and why I did it and this is what I found, but this asks the people who write to step back and to reflect on the processes they went through and the, the cul-de-sacs that they, yes, and, and how would they would yeah. invite other people into the messy world of the lab. Yes, in, absolutely. In and in fact, Juliana and I had to keep pushing back the manuscripts to the authors and saying, uh, this all reads as though you woke, like I said very, at the beginning, like you woke up one morning and, and understood the entire process from beginning to end. And uh, that I think was very useful for the both of us too and with the work of the authors. Like, yeah, but did it really unfold this way? I mean, it looks as though there's a, a lot of subtext that's missing. Like, I don't understand how you got from this conclusion to this artifact. Yeah, I'm reminded some people will remember when James D. Watson wrote the book, The Double Helix, about the discovery of the structure of DNA. And it was actually supposed to be published by the Harvard University Press, but they refused to publish it. And so it was published by, I think, Athenaeum. But the point was that it, um, it revealed the messiness of science and the gossip, and it, it kind of was the opposite of a research article where you say, this was a hypothesis, this is what I did, this is what I found, this is what it means. So I think you're all kind of undressing the, the process and showing its its messiness. I did have a thought, which maybe we could talk about later, which is we live in a, well, we, the, I would say the middle of the 20th century until now is a very hot model kind of talking um, thing. 
I mean, it comes out of history of science, and everybody's got models and you know, mental models and things like that. Now, people certainly went to school long before this, and they learned stuff without having model language. Um, uh, but I suspect, and I think this ties together with what, what, what Juliana and Mike spoke about, that it's the kids who pick up a model without any kind of explicit um, uh, um, I'm going to say modeling, explicit <laughs> pointing it out and lecturing about it and realizing that the model is deficient, who survived in school, and many of the rest of us didn't. Um, and what we're trying to do, when we're not just trying to pick out who the good students are, but reach the ones who aren't such good, so good, is to make the models much more explicit, and especially if teachers themselves are only used to, I mean, what was the famous story about Norbert Wiener? when somebody asked him, he did some kind of a proof, and someone said, well, can you explain how he did it? He just went up and just put the same thing on the board, assuming <laughs> everybody would know what was going on in his head. Um, uh, so I, I hear that as a theme. Um, so, David. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. So, hmm. I think, uh, so I'm gonna junk what I wrote down that I was gonna talk about uh, <laughs> and uh, do something different, but, uh, I like the sort of autobiographical thing, and uh, that was a story I never heard about, the double helix. So I want to tell my story then uh, when I was a uh, student here. And um, I got bored uh, as a doc student a little bit, so I uh, taught part-time all the time. So I taught high school for a little while, I taught first grade, I taught Head Start. And um, it seemed a great compliment to the studying I was doing here to be continuously teaching. And I really liked it. Um, and then I was studying with uh, Shep White, who I know Kurt knows very well, and uh, Howard too, um, because he was interested in particular, wrote a very widely uh, read paper called The Five to Seven Developmental Shift. It was about the changes that occur in kids at five to seven, the exact age that uh, Mike talked about. Um, why are there so many changes? And why does, in virtually every culture, when formal schooling starts, it starts in that period? So the paper sort of reviewed what's going on in children at five to seven years of age that makes us orient to them differently. And Shep knew nothing about brains or anything like that, but it was a lot of. Um, uh, psychological and testing and so on. Um, and I got really interested in, because I'd been a Head Start teacher and a first grade teacher, what was that transition all about? And I decided I would like to, and with Shep's support, say, well, is the brain changing in some fundamentally interesting way between five and seven years of age? And um, uh, I got deeply involved in uh, Neuroscience, mainly I was taking, there wasn't Kurt and Howard hadn't started the MBE field, so it was nothing here. So I would just go over to the Harvard Medical School, MIT, and I would take courses, everything I could get on neuroanatomy, neurophysiology. And it was fabulous in terms of the kind of things we're talking about here, this interdisciplinary thing. I'd be teaching Head Start, taking neuroscience, um, studying cognitive development with Shep White, this fabulous intersection that was so rich and lustrous. Um, and uh, it was pretty intimidating, but I got all the way to uh, advanced neuroanatomy at Harvard Medical School. I was at the top of the heap of that kind of student. And I was uh, able to, had my own human brains to dissect and all of that. And so I, I knew a lot. Um, and uh, then I began to think about what I was gonna do for a thesis. And I thought, well, I've got the background now. Can I really look at the literature on development, how brains develop, and see if there's something in five to seven. So I read widely, and of course, most of the literature was on rats and monkeys and things. But soon, I don't remember how long, I found a wonderful little article um, about postnatal neurogenesis in the dentate gyrus in rats. So the dentate gyrus is part of the hippocampus, and uh, for reasons I won't go into today, it was kind of a productive area to look. And for the first time, people found that new neurons were born at about around day 30 in rats. So rats before day 30-ish didn't have dentate gyrus granule cells. 
after day 30-ish, they had dentate gyrus granule cells. So it was a really a nice marker. And the question to me was, wow, does that happen in humans? So I checked, you know, and the evidence, and you guys will remember this, the absolute canon was there is no postnatal neurogenesis in humans. This is in 1970s. It was one of the fundamental truths of neuroscience that humans don't have postnatal germ. We have all the neurons we're gonna have when we're born, and they mature and myelinate and do all kinds of things like that, but we don't get new ones, because that upset the apple cart. But rats did. At, at uh, literally at day 30. So I did this enormous study of what changes in rats behaviorally, and I did the same study, 500 references. I just want to be clear that this was a lot of work, because uh, <laughs> my wife remembers it all. Um, uh, so I read virtually everything about what kids did in this period in every study that mapped up to the changes that happened in rats. And sure enough, kids at five to seven go through changes just like rats do at day 30. And I could map literally the same kinds of experiments, spontaneous alternation, successive approximations, all kinds of things that rats do for the first time. Kids did for the first time, it was fabulous. And I wrote my thesis and uh, the thesis committee loved it and all kinds of things. The publisher immediately wanted to publish it. So, gave me an advance. Um, so that's all the bragging part. But the question is, then what did I do? And um, I, oh, I didn't tell you the punchline. So in one little paragraph, and the thesis is right over there, I said, it looks to me like we must get postnatal neurogenesis of dentate gyrus granule cells in the hippocampus in this five to seven year period. And my thesis advisor, who was a physiological psychologist, one of the most prominent in the world, who was here at the time, he said, wow, that is really interesting. So he sent me to New York to the editor of the Brain Research Journal uh, to say, what do you think about this? Because he's challenging the canon <laughs> that there's no postnatal neurogenesis on behavioral evidence, it, you know, et cetera, not on the neuroanatomy. And I went into his office, I was scared to death, and I said, and I brought along staining stuff that I had found in the basement of Countway Library that showed there was, in fact, increases in what looked like the neurons that were myelinating in that area. It was enough to really point at it. So I showed it to him and he says, I'm sorry, there isn't any postnatal neurogenesis. <laughs> End of conversation. I met with him for two minutes. There is no postnatal neurogenesis. Okay, so the punchline is 15 years later, of course, the study comes out, and postnatal neurogenesis in dentate gyro cells, hippocampus, you know, uh, age five to seven. And now we know it goes on and on and on. So I actually could have been the guy who invented uh, <laughs> postnatal neurogenesis. But I didn't have the courage of my convictions. So the reason I wanted to start with this story is I wanted to say that an educator who taught Head Start was the one who actually first, and by the way, a bunch of people sent me, when that article came out, a bunch of people sent me said, you said it would happen, and it did 15 years later. And I felt great about that. So I just wanted to encourage you as educators that you know stuff. Yes. That it was that I looked carefully at what we know, and that allowed me to predict how the brain would develop. One of the dangers in this field of MBE is that we think the knowledge comes from the brain stuff to educators. And there's an a, a implied hierarchy. They know really cool stuff, and we should learn it because then we'll be better educators. And what I want to argue just while we're in the School of Education and why I came here and not the neuroscience school is that we know stuff. Teachers know a lot more about how learning really happens, what teaching really is. Neuroscientists are really loopy and nutty about what teaching and learning really are. They have incredibly narrow views. They're Skinnerian still. And we need to teach them. We need to say, these are the kinds of things that you need to be studying. These are the kind of things that are important. These are the evidence that you have postnatal neurogenesis that we know. So I just want to say, I am really glad that I came to the ed school because um, I wanted to do the kind of work that I ended up doing in Foaming Cast, but I want to encourage all of you that you know stuff, being fabulous teachers and studying carefully what really happens in the development of kids is really strong stuff. And uh, don't think that the, it's a one-way street from neuroscience to education. Right. I think that's a, a great... That, that's a great uh, message for all of us. There's a term which I, I'm not able to come up with, 
about what happens in science when you publish something before its time. I think Josh Letterberg, uh, the great uh, uh, bi biologist, created the term. And he created it about um, uh, Barbara McClintock, who you know, understood something about genetics decades before. It was sort of precocious, but that yeah. wasn't the term. I don't know whether Erwin or David knows the term. But um, there, there is the problem that when the field isn't ready to assimilate something, right. it, can be, it, can be, it can be ignored. But as you said, <laughs> you, have to get, you have to be very stubborn. Yeah. If, if More you, stubborn than that was. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. And this is very Piagetian, you know, this whole thing. It was yeah. just, field was not ready. But anyway, yeah. I just want to encourage you, because I wish now I had pushed harder. When he said, there isn't any, I should have said, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to teach you too. But yeah. it was a little bit too much for me at age 20. Yeah or whatever it was. So I'm keeping my eye on the clock. Um, I don't think we have to have a sharp break in 15 minutes, but uh, um, I don't know how the, 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 sc the streaming and so on is going. But I said that this was a time when people could either ask questions of the panel or because we're in a celebratory mode, if you want to reflect on your own experiences here, as some of us have done, that's fine. Um, um, so don't be, don't be shy or bashful. Uh, uh, there are two mics that are open. Uh, Erwin, if you would just go up to a mic. Yeah, thank you. That, there's one behind you. I have a bunch of I have a bunch of questions, but I'll <laughs> restrict. And I'll ask first Mike something that really intrigued me about his presentation. He pointed out, or you pointed out, that this person who didn't have any special background that you described in any way, who did this experiment of taking, isolating the most underprivileged children and giving them this whatever for 20 minutes a day and had miraculous results without any studies, without any, anybody producing books, without anyone producing curricula, and it worked magnificently. Why wasn't that model, if you pardon the expression, copied? It's a great question. So <clears throat> they did actually, so Griffin, Case, and Siegler, um, they did develop a, a prototype curriculum. So what's interesting is that there's this kind of notion of research-based education, and that's a complicated idea as well. What does that mean? In one sense, it means, well, I looked at the literature and I came up with a model and then I built something based on that. It's kind of hard to audit that. Did you do a good job, you know, and so on. Then there's this idea that we built the thing and then we tested it with kids and we looked at the outcomes. So they did both of those things. They built a curriculum and they validated that it worked and they had these big results. They did, in fact, hand it off to a publisher and that publisher did, in fact, publish it. So the curriculum exists. The problem was, I have a piece of it. This was a pre they were working with kids in pre-kindergarten and kindergarten, and that's where the science, that was the scope of the science. But the publisher took that sort of, the validation studies for this prototype, and then they blew it out to a pre-K through eighth grade curriculum, and they manualized the thing, and it's, I think it's completely unusable. I mean, you put this giant box in front of a first grade teacher and say, there's your, you know, there's your magic box. They've got to internalize all that stuff. That's the problem I was showing in my picture, that how do you get it, it's got to be effective, it's got to be usable, you know what I mean? It's got to somehow get into the teacher's head or be usable in the technology or something. So, that I see as the failure point is it got out there, they were still using those studies to promote it as a marketing tool, but they didn't validate that their implementation at scale actually had the same effects. And my guess is that it, it doesn't. So it's, it's a great question, but I think that's the answer to your question. Why isn't this model being replicated? Because you've got this silos and each silo has people with different skills and different incentives. And when you throw it over to the publisher, they just want to figure out how to make as, well, it's not, that's cynical. I don't mean they want to make as much money as possible, but they actually have to stay in business, right? So they've got different constraints. But I, I think it's important to point out that these weren't three random people. These mm. were serious cognitive yeah. scientists who we all knew, um, and they worked on it a long time. The McDonald Foundation supported that work, but it doesn't take away from what Mike said. Even when you have a very good idea which works under, um, 
conditions where you can determine who spends 20 minutes a day on something. Uh, David? I just can't help but saying that all four of us had a story of where a mental model that was incorrect has been applied by very smart people. That this is the nature of, our, our brains are fabulous model building things with great pluses and great minuses. And it's one of the great lessons is to figure out how do we change models when people think what we teach is long division or stuff. But the models are what really make the difference. And we're always going to be butting up against that. Yeah. Well, you're allowed another question since I don't see anybody else at the mic. <laughs> OK, good. Uh, thank you. Yeah, no, please if, uh, speak now because we're going to. Uh... Yeah, I, I wanted to uh, ask a quick question about um, there was talk of the lab work done by cognitive and neuroscientists and, and uh, some of the applied work done in the classroom. And I'm wondering, what's the opportunity to bring some of the neurocognitive tools into a more ecologically, ecologically valid setting? To uh, What tools do you think can transfer? Obviously, lab in lab tasks, we often have very um, artificial tasks that you have to do over and over again for us to be able to average across scan. So do you see opportunity for, for uh, those tools in a more ecologically valid setting? I think any of us can say a little bit about that because uh, our work is grounded in ecologically <clears throat> valid settings. Um, the algebra by example materials also apropos to the previous question, like what are the barriers? We addressed this question of barriers to uptake early on, uh, first by failing to address them, uh, and then by learning from those failures. So things like our first algebra by, uh, algebra by example assignments uh, had 12 problems on them and were printed on legal sized paper. Um, and then by the end, we were at eight and a half by 11 bound, so the teachers didn't have to figure out the individual assignments. They could just have these other pieces freely downloadable on the web. Web, it turns out that free is actually a big problem um, because you don't have people in school districts making decisions about how to get free stuff um, at the school district level. At the school district level, you've got somebody you know, scanning through available materials that they're going to purchase. So we made them Instead of freely downloadable and printable, we made them cost for the print. Um, so ecologically valid, I think this question around MBE research in particular is to conduct the studies in a way that you're crafting new knowledge but new tools at the same time um, in ecologically valid settings. Because you're right that otherwise you're left with this funny translation issue that didn't take into account the original condition problems that you actually have to address. I would add to that as well, that it's like a battlefield of models out there in the, in the schools of how different individuals think students learn. Right? So you have the teacher has a model about learning and teaching, and, and the principal has one as well, and the superintendent, and, and there are even legislators who have theirs as well. And they're making decisions about how classes should be organized, how long the class should be, what kinds of materials you get. And so there's as I was thinking about it, it is a battlefield. And you know, what is the model that survives? I mean, the one that the teacher is going to use in the moment in which there's an unfolding experience for the student. And I've been curious about that because I've encountered a lot of very powerful learning models. I find that most students don't use them easily or intuitively. So actually, I started some work with a neuroscientist a, a couple years ago, and we just looked at, are there 10, well, it doesn't have to be 10, but it was just a handful of basic neuroscience principles. And we designed a, a number of activities that just illustrated these principles in, in, um, in operation, like plasticity. Right? So there was a basic uh, neuroscience principle. There was an activity to uh, elaborate the nature of the principle. And what we were wondering was, over time, would these principles be competitive with whatever models teachers were using to make decisions about what to do in the classroom? So we just finished the first round, where we were interested in looking at the teacher's lesson plans, which they brought into the classroom at the beginning of this experiment. And we asked them, based on whatever neuroscience you know, what changes would you make to your lesson plan? So we had that as a pre. And after we, looked, after we spent 
10, 15 days with these basic neuroscience principles and the activities to support them. We asked them to take their lesson back and say, would you make any changes now based on what you know and to uh, defend that with any of those principles. So uh, what we found was some uh, promising. Uh, many of them made changes and justified those changes based on these principles. Of course, there's still a missing element. What would they actually do in the classroom? We don't know that yet. Uh, we did follow them into the classroom six months later, so we're still trying to process that data to figure out what did they actually do and, and why did they do it and were these neuroscience principles relevant? But, but it gets down to the idea of in the moment, what is the model you're using to make the decision about what to do, what to ignore, and how to act? I mean, th these are important issues because I think teaching in the moment is one of the most complex, challenging jobs there is. And I've had a lot, and I know my colleagues have as well. I'm going to suggest a procedural thing. Um, and I'm going to do two lightning rounds with the panel. Lightning round is to talk about one thing that you're doing these days, which Oh, sorry, a real question. Oh, sorry. <laughs> this may contribute to your lightning, lightning round, actually. Thank you to the panel and for all your, all your great work. While we have all of you here together thinking about different models and different languages that we use even in our own field, I wonder if you have any advice in helping to better translate all of the great work that's happening to get back into the classroom um, and to the great teachers that are out there in the field to better translate all of the work across neuroscience, cognitive sciences, and all else. Thanks. Can I take a quick stab? Um, first, I would recommend get rid of the word translate um, and think of yourselves as knowledge mobilizers um, and knowledge utilizers. There's uh, an interesting thing right about boundaries and border crossings. After working on research practice partnerships and about translational kind of things for more than a decade, I came across uh, literature that's very popular in terminology that's very popular in Canada and a little bit in Europe which is this knowledge mobilization, knowledge utilization, which are terms that most of you probably haven't heard where you have heard translation. So I would recommend looking up these ideas around knowledge mobilization and knowledge utilization and think of yourselves um, in that mode rather than simply translating because the ideas that you have coming from your own experience, you're mobilizing that knowledge, not just mobilizing the knowledge that comes and pulls in and you know sprinkles on us from neuroscience and the cognitive sciences. So I would say that. So Howard and I and Zach, the chapter that this picture originally was written for is is in a book called Neuroscience and Education, The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. And this one is something about design patterns. And it's actually a proposal for how to do what you're asking. It, and it's, a, it's taking an idea of design patterns from architecture and then computer science. The idea being that one of the problems we have is we get together at conferences and we've got teachers and researchers and there's a huge translational gap there. Translational, I mean, in terms of language, right? There's a huge problem there. So, and you have to have all the right people in the room in that case, right? And it's like, oh, they're all here, we can do something. And if they're not, nothing happens. So the idea would be, creating some sort of a database type thing where teachers log problems, educators sort of lodge research questions and explanatory models, and then, like I said, the MBE types translate in between. But then you've got this kind of store, this repository or library almost of, of and the idea of a design pattern is it's a solution that works and that you can kind of replicate with variations uh, around, and there's examples in the chapter of how, how that would look. So that's one idea. So two lightning rounds. Lightning round number one, talk about something you're working on now that you're excited about that has something to do with MBE. And lightning round number two, one prediction about what's going to happen to this field, say, 15, 20 years from now. Um, and uh, Mark, we're going to start with you. So uh, just, just uh, let's do, but, but let's do two rounds. So the first round is something you're working on now that you're interested in that you want to share with the audience. So I, I started with that uh, sort of in response to uh, your question because I, as I was saying, I was, uh, I've, I've been teaching now for a long time, I don't know, maybe 35 plus years and I've been struck by what would it take to change the way someone, I'm talking to you, but I'm actually talking to everyone, I think. Uh, you know, what would it take to change the way that you think about teaching? So I, 
I'm trying to find you know, the, the right kind of insight that a teacher can use that's powerful enough that it can shape the way that they're thinking about the classroom and about the learner in the classroom. So describe, I'd already briefly described the research. I'd like to, it's a pilot study. It would be great to, to uh, pursue this in a more controlled way so that we can find out whether or not it was the, the neural principles, was it the, the activities we used that um, enhanced the, or uh, display the, the operation of the new principle. So it still needs to be controlled, there's still a lot to, uh, to do, but it looks promising. So uh, follow that into the classroom and see what happens. That's, we need powerful tools, that, and, these par and the powerful tool I'm thinking about right now is conceptual. It's, uh, Good, thanks. Um, I initiated a collaboration a few years ago with uh, the woman who runs the survivorship clinic at Hopkins um, around pediatric uh, cancer survivors, and she brought in a neuropsychologist from Kennedy Krieger. We uh, got lucky and got funding on our first go around to have an engagement project with families affected by childhood cancer whose kids have gone back to school uh, and heard over and over again during our interviews shocking things like going back to school was harder than getting cancer. Hmm. That the challenges of working with a school system that is uh, appropriately, I guess, right, unaware of the challenges that these kids can face because it's a very low incidence disease. Many teachers will never have had um, a child who's had cancer in the past. But that um, lack of familiarity is not an excuse for putting up enormous barriers for those children to be able to have access to certain kinds of processes and services that are protected under IDEA. Um, so this is a place where issues related to biology, belief, and behavior are really uh, potent and make a profound difference in other kids' lives. And I'll say that people are a lot more interested to hear about work around return to school for childhood cancer than they are around work related to algebra for some reason. <laughs> Thank you, three Bs. So David, tell us how you're flunking retirement. So, yeah. <laughs> so I now spend uh, a bunch of my time raising three grandchildren. Um, I am the child care person on Mondays and Tuesdays. And um, the striking thing, I can't believe I'm learning it at age 72, is how I get to see it so much better, of course, because I don't have the full responsibility of being the parent. But watching them, it's just so powerful how, uh, what powerful little learners they are. And this isn't because they're smart or anything, it's just because of the way our human brains have developed. They are incredibly motivated to learn. And we in education have done a bad job of talking about kids as being unmotivated to learn, he's not a good learner, whatever, which is a, just a ridiculous thing. This brain, you cannot stop it from learning. There's nothing you can do to stop it. I used to joke with graduate students, try not to learn anything for the next 20 <laughs> seconds. It's not possible. You learn when you're sleeping. It's just, you're, it's a fabulous learning brain. And just watching these kids just pouring, when I take them into anything, they're just looking at, what can I learn here? The problem is education is we have created uh, contexts which are very bad learning environments which evaporate out that incredible drive to learn. And we've said, we don't want you to learn things that you may be really interested in. We want you to learn the things we're interested in and we're gonna give you extraneous rewards that are weird to try to make you do what we want you to do. And we're gonna do ABA training to make autistic kids into not autistic kids. And we're gonna do all these things that don't make any sense in terms of the brain. It's a fabulous instrument. And every day I just go, oh my God, you cannot stop little Breton from learning it's amazing so <laughs> we're looking forward in, in three minutes to your 15 year prediction yeah <laughs> uh, so I'm working on a book uh, on formative assessment for teachers and my you know my interest part of what's really interesting to me about this work is is the piece of making it usable like I was talking about before so that's really the emphasis in the book is trying to connect the research on formative assessment with the fact that that's what good teachers do. They already know this. It's, a, it's kind of a, it's almost, it's a technical You should term, explain right? formative versus summative because. Oh, sure. So uh, formative assessment, so summative assessment is what you kind of associate with school. You get grades at the end of the semester. Summative, it means it's kind of summing up your whole performance over the year and it's 
assigning a grade to it and, and it's you're done. That's kind of the, the grade you get for all time. Formative assessment, so it's like the Olympics, right? Um, if you win the gold, that's a kind of a summative assessment. When you're training for the Olympics, you know, you're using the same instruments. You might be measuring your time and so on, your coaches, but then they're telling you, oh, you, you sort of jumped into the water too shallow. You got to kind of dig deep or whatever. So um, that's formative because you're using the data in order to inform some change. The coach is changing how they're intervening. The, the, you know, the student is changing how they're performing. So formative assessment is really a process, even though it's got the same word assessment in there. It's not a kind of test. It's a process of using data to inform changes to the instruction. Uh, summative assessment is, is, is kind of the, is the evaluation at the end of some period of learning. So I'm writing this book, and like I said, the emphasis is on good teachers do this. This is what they do, is they look at kids and they say, oh, this is what's going on with you, and they diagnose it, and then they, they intervene appropriately, and they adapt the instruction. So, and the remarkable thing is, in, in the book anyway, I kind of go through, you know, there's this body of research that shows that it's one of the most powerful levers we know of in education. Education research, we don't usually find very large effects, but with formative assessment, they're quite huge. Um, if we could do it across the board, for example, we could move the United States from the middle of the pack where we are now to the up with the five, kind of the Pacific Rim countries, the top five in the world. Um, so it's a, it's a very powerful lever. And Who, who's the book for? For teachers. So well, we, I'm going to give you a suggestion. Yeah. Don't call it formative assessment. <laughs> yeah, that, we don't have entitled it yet. The, the, man, <laughs> the manuscript is written. I, I have a note. The right I have metaphor. a note that says we need a better title. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I, yeah. I'm hoping the editor can help. Yeah. Um, okay. yeah, but that's the idea: is to just help teachers to see. It's almost Socratic. You already know this, and and all of these models, RTI, and you know, um, and mastery learning, and all these things are just different ways of trying to use formative assessment to, to get better outcomes in the classroom. They all have different names and they all look slightly differently, but they're really just trying to solve the same problem. Thank you. Sure. Excuse my impertinence. No, um, it's all good, yeah. Uh, so now, uh, one prediction from each of you and we're, we're done. A prediction? Uh, is it re to the, about to the general field that we, we're, we're gathered about. So I guess the prediction would depend on the, the model. <laughs> <laughs> that IMBIS, the International Mind Brain Education Society, MBE, uses going forward. So if it's, if it's truly collaborative, then, as I've said all along, which is the, which is the uh, part of the heart and soul of the book, then with the right tools that enhance collaboration, then I think there's a promising future where we learn to work together to solve very complex problems. To the extent that we use competitive models, one that uh, look more like uh, the industry version of you know, producing uh, television sets as they go down the uh, assembly line, and uh, that's what uh, children are exposed to, are automatized lessons that uh, you can walk in from one classroom into the next and you see the exact same thing, which I see a lot in Texas. Uh, Sorry for all my Texas friends who are listening to this. Uh, but to the extent that I think it looks more like that, I, it doesn't feel as promising to me. Uh, so I think that th to the extent that the MBE students here and, and colleagues who want to transition to that push back a little bit to open up the conversation so that we can start challenging the way we look uh, at the world, what counts as an education. I mean, we have like these, uh, these kinds of conversations that push those limits, and I think that there is a promising future for MBE, and MBE can facilitate, can broker these kinds of conversations. I, I think that's where we have the greatest uh, hope for doing something promising. <coughs> Thank you. <coughs> yeah, so my my prediction um, is that first in independent schools and gradually in more progressive public schools, that there will be new kinds of job <coughs> opportunities for people who are called knowledge mobilizers or something like that. And these will be folks who are hired not to siphon research, but to partner uh, with research communities in order to generate new knowledge. And I make that prediction um, on the grounds that all of you students, graduates, um, are going to go out there and see that the kind of jobs you want aren't there yet. And you're going to go to these schools and you're going to say, you know what you need? You need an MBE knowledge mobilizer. And let me tell you what I do and you'll see why you need that. And they'll say, yeah. And the knowledge mobilizer might be the right title for, for Mike's book. <laughs> David? <laughs> so, progress already. Uh, so, uh, 
I guess I wanted to say that I think uh, the field will be incredibly unstable, um, even chaotic, and that's a compliment um, in that uh, I think it's one of these Russian doll things. This field is inside something else, and other things are inside it, and it gets smarter when it rubs up against the things it's inside of and the things that are inside of it. So I gave my example of it was great to learn neuroscience, something that was inside of five to seven year olds, but um, the work I do at CAST, we found we've bumped up against what we're inside of, which is policy, for example. Things policy have done things to schools that have made them not very good learning environments. The whole testing uh, craziness uh, has made it so that kids are forced to do things that do evaporate that natural thing that my uh, grandchildren are doing now and other blah, 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 all of that. So rubbing up against that, uh, Sorry, the last thing I'll say is that the Ed Review here did a great article on UDL is what we do, Universal Design for Learning, and critiqued it by saying it's not taking into account um, the, uh, culturally, the cultural differences in the US. It's too focused, it's too narrow, and it was a, a wonderful critique, and it said you are not recognizing what you're inside of, which is cultures and policies which are having huge effects on individual kids, and you need to pay attention to those and make UDL intersect. So uh, well, CAS is having to have this whole new understanding of what MBE means in the context of the culture at large, its policies and its preferences, and its disabilities. Last word, Mike. Oh, yeah. The end. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, so I think David's exactly right. Cha chaotic is the right description, and I think it, it it could be very productive, uh, you know, chaos is unpredictable by nature. But I think that we can kind of predict the nature of that chaos. Uh, what I see is that we are fighting the system. Like we're trying to use this science to improve outcomes for students. And we're fighting the structure of the system right now. That's been my experience for 20 years. And I kind of described it a little bit, but I think what has to happen is the system has to reconfigure. And you know the, the story in the chapter is kind of trying to lay out what that reconfiguration needs to look like. It needs to look like um, you can't hand this stuff off. You can't sort of have a theory and hand it off to a publisher. That is never going to work, not in a million years. And that's what we keep trying to do. And so we have to figure out what's the, what's the right What's the right way to structure the pipeline? And I think if we can, I don't know the timeline, but if we can, if one possible scenario to project out would be that we actually, somebody manages to do that. And I think if they do it right and they are using the right theory in an area that matters to society, it would be such a big effect that you could not ignore it. But right now we're fighting all of these layers of you know, policy and funding and, and disciplinary boundaries and stuff that are killing them at various stages and we're just not getting things to the light. So, so that would be my hope is that somebody does it and then that becomes the new model. That, that, to, you know, that once you have a demonstration of not only that it can be done and that we know how to do it, but that it has huge effects when you do it, that will become the new model. So that's always been my hope is let's build the demonstration. That's why I did this. That's why I started this company is let's build one. We can't just talk about it in academic terms. We have to show it. So I'm hoping that'll be the, uh, the outcome. So let me make a, just a, a minute or so benedictory comments. We began with talking about the history of this field, which really began on this street. Um, and we have represented here all the generations <laughs> from the, the elder founders <laughs> to the middle aged to the uh, just beginning uh, their teaching career. And in the audience, we have um, individuals who are uh, learning about these things. And of course, the future will uh, really lie in, in your hands much more than in the hands of the of the old timers. Um, if I'd ask myself the question about 15 years from now, um, I don't know that I would have had a very good answer, but I'll toss one out. And that is, um, there's some things which weren't discussed very much tonight. Uh, um, Mike mentioned artificial intelligence. I don't think anybody mentioned virtual reality, but you know, teaching to virtual reality can be you know, very generative. Um, and we're going to find out more about the brain and more about genetics. And uh, there's going to be a competition among these different fields and these different ways of knowing 
I think what distinguishes the panel and the people in this room and the people in the street is we, we, want, to want, we want to want to use these sources of knowledge to help the human component rather than to eliminate the human component. Mm -hmm. But there's lots of pressures, not just economic, but actually mental models that if we can just get the brain stuff right or just get the AI right or just get the virtual reality right, we can do, we won't give the people in West Virginia any more money, we'll just get rid of them. This is a reference to the, the, mm -hmm. the two week uh, strike of teachers there. Um, so that's how I would answer the question. Um, I would like to thank you all for coming this evening. And uh, there is a reception, is that right? Uh, is that, where is that, upstairs? Upstairs in Elliot Lyman. Lyman. So you're invited and you have a chance to meet the panel and also to greet uh, uh, our, uh, our founder, uh, uh, Kurt, and his wife, Jane. So thank you all and join me in thanking the panel. Thank you.